Well, it's uh, great to be here. First time up here at the point. What a beautiful location. You guys, I mean, it's pretty, it must be the envy of Silicon Valley churches to be up here in the hillside. Man, this is really great. It is a pleasure to be here, and, uh, you know, uh, I've appreciated uh, getting to know Cal a little bit as we prepared for today. I want to tell you a little bit of my story and then uh, hopefully empower you a bit with what it means and uh, this Made for Monday series that's being kicked off, you know, what it means to be a Christian in the workplace and what it means to sort of enter into the workplace each week, but doing so in the presence and power of God. So a little bit of my story, uh, I was uh, born and raised in the Pennsylvania farm country. So if you're back there, you have the Pennsylvania Dutch, the Pennsylvania Mennonites, and the Amish. Right, the Amish were the ultra conservatives, and then the Mennonites, they're like really conservative. So I was Pennsylvania Dutch, so we were the liberals, right? <laughs> Which comparatively is like super conservative, but born, born and raised in the farm country back there. I thought I was a Christian growing up. And, uh, you know, I was baptized when I was six days old, right, with full knowledge of what I was doing. Right, and uh, you know, president of the youth group and bapt uh, was confirmed when I was 12. Of course, I was a Christian, right? You know, what else is there? So, and then uh, my father was a family of 10, and uh, his uh, uh, son number one, son number two of my grandfather, they grandpa helped them get farms. They got down to my dad at number nine and says, We have enough farms in the family, so just work with your siblings. And had my dad had a farm, I was the oldest son, I'd be a farmer in Pennsylvania today. Guaranteed, oldest son, he inherits the farm, I liked working with my dad. So from uh, cow chips to computer chips, right? Uh, you know, pretty amazing uh, journey. Uh, came to California when I was 18 years old. I had skipped my last year and a half of high school, got my associate's degree, and Intel came recruiting. And, uh, you know, I, the, uh, the interviewer, his name was Ron Smith, he wrote in his sheet of paper after he interviewed me, smart, aggressive, arrogant, he'll fit right in. Right, so I got invited out to interview, and at 18 years old, I had never been on an airplane. So here I am, this Pennsylvania farm boy, a free trip to California. What do you think I said, Cal? For sure, man, two nanoseconds? Yeah, I'm going to take that trip, but I was not going to move to California. I mean, you all are crazy out here, right? So, uh, you know, come out here and uh, accepted the job, and uh, Intel had this policy that you could work and go to school. So uh, decided to take the job out here and uh, moved at 18 uh, years old and uh, started my juggling journey because I was working full time at Intel and then I started to go to school full time at Santa Clara for my bachelor's degree and then at uh, Stanford for my P uh, master's and PhD work. And, you know, it was a pretty, uh, spec you know, I love this technology and love what I was doing and was starting to have some, you know, success and promotions and accolades for uh, that. And, uh, but I had always gone to church each Sunday. And there are two good reasons to go to church growing up. You know, one was I got in trouble with dad. The other was to meet girls and impress their mothers and grandmothers. Yeah, that, it works. So, uh, you know, sure enough, I go to Sunday and uh, church that first Sunday to Santa Clara Christian Church. And who do they meet? But Linda. Right? So it's working. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Linda, she sort of took pity on me as this uh, transplant from Pennsylvania. So uh, she, in fact, it was uh, uh, October when I had moved out here. And come December, I had neither money nor vacation time. And uh, we weren't dating or anything, but she took pity on me and invited me over for Christmas Eve dinner. And it's Linda, her mom, and her grandmother. And grandma and I, we hit it off great. Yeah, and as we ended the night, you know, a good meal, playing games and stuff like that, you know, I leave, grandma closes the door, turns to Linda and says, he's the one. <laughs> and Linda starts enumerating my many shortcomings. <laughs> well, a few months later, uh, we start to date a little bit, but uh, uh, I was on the slow boat to matrimony. You know, I was going to finish my bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdoc work before even thinking about getting married, right? Because growing up, school was super important. You know, mom sort of pounded that into our heads, you know, get your degrees, get your degrees. So I start uh, uh, going to school, working, 
dating, this hobby. You know, we see each other on weekends a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was just this wonderful life that we had. And then God had a different plan. And uh, Linda had endometriosis. And uh, the doctor said, kids, now or never. Remember, I'm on the 10-year plan. We're now about a year and a half into the 10-year plan. This was not my plan. And after a summer of agonizing, we decide to uh, get married. And uh, she had had surgery. One ovary removed, part of the second one, you know, kid, you know maybe never. Right? And uh, sure enough, that uh, uh, after it, we have Elizabeth, uh, who's here, our oldest on the uh, left, or yeah, on your left. And uh, that was our first one. We named her after uh, the, uh, uh, the mother of John the Baptist, right, you know, from the barren womb. And then, uh, well, Josiah, and then Nathan, and then Micah. You know, this seems to be working pretty good. So, you know, we have our family of four, and uh, then uh, there are three of the four are now married. We now have six grandchildren. Life's pretty good, right? And in fact, uh, this one here on, uh, uh, on your right here, Evangeline was born February 2nd, and uh, Clara, the one I'm holding here in the middle, uh, was born uh, January 24th. So, you know, uh, you know, may your quiver be full of them. And I'll tell you, you know, grandchildren, you love them twice, when they show up and when they go home, right? You know, it really is a pretty special period of life uh, as well. So, you know, God has certainly blessed us, right, uh, in this period of life. And, uh, you know, job has been pretty incredible. You know, I've had what I call the Cinderella career. How many of you have ever used a computer? Okay, right? I've worked on 30 years of microprocessors, so if you've used the computer, you've worked, you've used some of the things I've done. How many of you ever use USB? Okay, I helped create USB. How many of you ever use Wi-Fi? I helped create Wi-Fi, right? You know, just, you know, I'll just say some of these seminal technologies have been, you know, uh, you know I've been blessed and, you know, right, became the uh, CTO, the first ever CTO uh, for uh, Intel, uh, have had, became the youngest uh, vice president at Intel, just, you know, an incredible uh, career over the many years. And I love technology, right? You know, it's just one of those things where this opportunity to create things that truly change humanity, to me is just uh, thrilling, the opportunities. And now, uh, you know, we had 10 years, Linda and I met, we had all four of our kids in the Bay Area, we moved to Oregon for 20 years, continuing to work for Intel, so I had a, a short 30 year stint there. Uh, and then uh, we moved to Boston for three years uh, to uh, work for EMC, and then I had the opportunity to become the CEO of Intel. I'm, I'm VMware, ah, what am I saying? <laughs> I did have that opportunity. Anyway, no, we don't go there. Um, so uh, the opportunity to become the uh, CEO of uh, VMware. You know, being CEO of a Silicon Valley software company, what do you think? There's worse jobs, aren't there? Right? And, you know, very successful uh, company. We're about, to, you know, uh, closing in on $10 billion of revenue. You know, I have 25,000 souls in my uh, uh, community there at VMware that I'm responsible. And I think of it very similar to, you know, Cal, how do you think about the people in your church, their lives, the families that they're part of, the communities that they're part of. And in many ways, that's how I think about my community at VMware and the 25,000 people that are under my leadership, my care. And I have, a, how many of my VMware team are here today? I know I have a few of them up here, right, as well. Yeah, you know, these are my folk, right? And, uh, you know, getting recognitions uh, for that, you know, has been uh, exciting. But not all days are good days as CEO. And in fact, uh, 2016, the worst year of my career. We had the Dell EMC merger. Our stock went from 80 to 40. That's like the score of the quarterback in the football game. And at that point, I suck. Right? You know, we had our son had cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, Josiah that year. I had broken my foot, right? Just all these terrible things going on. And uh, last week, our stock hit $204 a share. A lot worse things can happen to a CEO. And God is faithful through the hard as well as through the good times. And through that, you know, we've seen very much how he sharpens you how he uses those times. And I say, you don't grow in periods of success. You grow in periods of change and challenge. 
And that's the time when God brings you to maturity. Now, you know, I was a young, uh, 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 almost Christian when I showed up in California. Uh, Linda had met me, and early in our time together, she asked me if I was a Christian. And what did I say? Of course. You know, I was baptized when I was six days old. I president of the youth group. What else is there? Then she saw my lifestyle, and she wasn't so sure. And, uh, you know, she and the others in the uh, young adults group started to pray for me. And in February of 1980, the sermon topic was Revelation 3, 15 and 16. I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And that verse convicted me in February of uh, 1980. And at that point, I decided I would become hot for God and accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And, you know, I thought I was an almost Christian, maybe even a Christian, until I came face to face with what it meant to be hot for God. And so that began my spiritual journey. I have my family and that journey that we're on and full-time work. And I consider that what we call the juggling years, right? How do you make it all fit? And that's the topic I really want to drill into a bit more in our time together. How many of you have plenty of excess time? How many of you struggle to make it all fit? Okay, those who have excess time, you can go to sleep for the next 10 minutes. Everybody else... Maybe we have some ideas for how we can make it all fit. And I call this the juggling years. You know, how do you make it fit in this period of life when you have too many demands, too many pressures, you know, you're struggling just to get by. And, you know, as we think about that, you know, I love this uh, passage, right? Um, And, uh, you know, this idea, and let's just look at this verse a little bit, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. You know, do you every day, when you show up on Monday, are you making the most of every opportunity that's presented to you that day? In my late 20s, I had had a very successful run at Intel. I had the 386. I became the design manager of the 486. You know, I had my first patent, right? How many of you read my first book? No? It's called Program in the 86. You didn't read it? You get to the last chapter, you turn paging on. I mean, it's just thrilling. I can't believe you didn't read it, right? I had become the youngest vice president at the company, right? I had had sort of this unwritten list of things I was trying to get done. And this period of aimlessness sort of settled on me. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? And out of that came this period, I'll say, of sort of settling this idea of what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And, you know, as you're struggling with how do you make everything fit, I would challenge you to say, have you really thought about how you want to use the rest of your life? What's the most important resource God gives you? Time. And have you thought carefully about how you want to use the rest of your life, how you want to use your time. And out of that came the idea of writing a mission statement. And I would just encourage each one of you to think about what it is you want to do with the rest of your life. And this idea of a mission statement, writing down, struggling, agonizing over the things you want to accomplish with the rest of your life. And my mission statements, it's in the book. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But this idea of a mission, what do you want to know? Sort of your epitaph for your, what do you want to be known for? And then your values, what are your governing principles that you're living your life by? And finally, specific goals, things you want to accomplish with your life. Now, when you've agonized through it, you draft it, you put it in the drawer, then you take it out, you hand it to your best friend, your spouse, and you say, is this who you think God may be to be? And you work on it. And then finally, as you sort of agonize through it, it becomes this picture that you're saying, that's what I want to be and how I want to live. You know, and I'd ask each one of you, how many of you want to have a great family, you know, a thriving spiritual life, and a great career? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Okay, how many of you want to live a ruthlessly disciplined life that you work hard, you make difficult uh, trade-offs, and you live highly prioritized and disciplined every day? 
Okay, let's try this again. How many of you want to leave an absolutely fulfilling life, right, with great family, great spiritual success, and great career success? Okay, how many of you want to live a highly disciplined life? Brothers and sisters, the two go together. And that's what a mission statement is about, getting very clear on what you want to do with the rest of your life and then living that way. And the most powerful words for living a fulfilled, made for Monday life is no. Making those hard trade-offs and decisions. So first, a mission statement. You know, second, setting clear priorities for your life, the things that you want to be known for each day on your journey, and deciding every day that you're going to live according to your priorities. Now, what are the Silicon Valley priorities for your life? Work, family, and God. What are the God-given priorities for life? God, family, and work. Silicon Valley, work, family, God. God-given priorities, God, family, work. And let's just unpack this a little bit today and you know, ask the question, how do you put God on the throne every day? Right, how do you start out your day putting God on the throne of your life and making that your number one priority? Starting out in personal devotion time each day, starting out in prayer and you know, thinking through carefully your day and putting God in the front of those things. Beginning each day by putting him on the throne of your life. God, family, work. And also, and I, you know, I love this passage here, right? Let's just maybe read it together. And let us consider how we may spur, that means you're supposed to read it with me. Let's try this again. Okay. Read together. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, what we're doing here is putting God on the throne each day, not forsaking the gathering of us coming together. And I'd encourage each one of you, you know, are you in a small group? Are you studying the word regularly? Are you in, right, you know, you, you know is this a once in a month kind of thing that you show up and, you know, just because you have a special speaker and you like uh, the sermon topic today? Or is this part of your life? Right? Is this how you want to raise your kids and the family, that they're involved in church programs, the youth groups? You know, are you forsaking the meeting together, or are you committing that that's part of who you are and your lifestyle of putting God every day on the throne of your life? God, family, work. And every day coming back one time after the other and saying, yes, in fact, I'm going to put God on the throne of my life every day. I have a prayer partner, uh, Gregory, and uh, we pray and fast on Thursdays, right? And we're just challenging each other, right? You know, how's it going, Gregory? How's the family? How's the kids? How's your relationship with your wife? And just constantly coming back and putting God back on the throne because everything around us, every pressure, right, of our valley and jobs is pressing him underneath, putting God on the throne every day of our life. And what's the second priority? Family, right, in front of work. And, you know, how many of you have ever had this conversation with your spouse or somebody else about you working too much? Anybody ever have that? You know, Linda and I, right, we, you know, we, we don't argue a lot, but that topic has been the argument of our marriage for most of our 37 years almost together, right? And, right, how do you then balance putting family in front of work? on a regular basis. Now, you know, we, we had this uh, little argument one time, and it sort of went like this. You haven't been getting home much, uh, home much lately. Well, actually, I've done better this month than last month. No, you haven't. Yes, you have. No, you haven't. Yes, you have. No, you haven't. Right? How many, you ever have those conversations? Not very productive, huh? Right? You know, as we sort of spiral downward. So what we did in response to that, we started the at-home chart. Okay? So we kept score 
I'm a goal-oriented guy. Keeping score is sort of who I am, right? So if I was home by 6.15, that was one point. If I was home by 5, that was two points. If I was home after 6.15, zero, that was the numerator. If I was gone weekends, that was negative points, and the denominator was the number of work days. So the at-home chart, right? Some days I'd be sitting at the end of the street at 6.10. Hey, boys, got to go. I'm getting a point tonight, right? And, uh, and then my secretary, so we had an independent neutral arbiter who would produce the at-home chart once a month. <laughs> yeah, it worked, because I'm a goal-oriented guy. We kept score. And I just say for each of us who are struggling with that idea of family, what are you doing to keep score? How are you making sure you're keeping those things in balance? You know, your kids don't care what time you leave for work in the morning. If you leave at 4 a.m. or 6 a.m., do they care? No. Are you home in 6 to 9 p.m., the precious family hours? Matters a lot. And fight to be home and be engaged in their families. Dating your kids. Uh, we started what we call breakfast dates with dad. Once a week we'd go, you know, we have four kids, so once a week we'd go to breakfast with each one of the kids, right? And so once a month had breakfast with each one, and we still do it today. Right? You know, three of them are in the area. I still do breakfast dates with my uh, kids today. You know, it's that bond that you build with them. Dating your spouse, right? You know, Linda and I would go on uh, dates, right? You know, and every once in a while, the kids would say, hey, why are you guys going out and not us? That's the point, right? Because at the end of 20 years of child rearing, do you know each other, right? Or has it just become all invested in the kids? Right, getting away on vacations together. The first 10 years of my time at Intel, I spent zero vacation days. Why go on vacation? I loved work. Why leave it? Right? I was being successful, being rewarded, had lots of work pressures to get done. Why go? And then Linda one day said to me, she says, you may not need vacation, but the family needs you on vacation. God, family, work in that order. And then, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but work. Christians should be the very best employees because you're working for the author of the universe. Your standards should be higher than all others. If you get the promotion, was God surprised? If you don't get the promotion, was God surprised? Lord be praised, and may you act every day in the workplace like Jesus is truly your CEO. God, family, and work. So, setting a mission, knowing where you're going, Second, being clear about your priorities and putting these guardrails into your life to live that way. And then finally, maybe some help along the way. Now, you know, this is, uh, I, I, you know, this experience in my career was just one of those seminal moments, but I was in charge of taping out the 8386. Now, the 386 was a super, anybody remember the 386? Yeah, okay, thank you. I appreciate you. It's so good, right? You know, that was my chip, and I was in charge of getting it into production uh, at the time, and this tape-out process was a super intense phase of the chip development, the microprocessor development phase, and we're just getting the 3D6 into production. And as I was, I had to give an update to the executive staff of Intel on getting the 3D6 taped out. Now, here's the executive staff. I'm way down here, and I'm presenting to them. You know, and here's Andy Grove, the seminal figure of Silicon Valley. Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, you know, one of the most critical figures, right? Uh, Robert Noyce, a winner of the, uh, co-winner of the Nobel Prize for the Integrated Circuit. They're in the front row. I'm dweeb engineer presenting to them. And I describe to them the computers are not stable enough, and if you don't fix my computers, I'm not getting my chip out the door. And I was just this little precocious brat, you know, presenting to the executive. I mean, it was really, you know, I look back on this, you know, boy, you, you were certainly wound up. And, uh, you know, so a couple of days later, I'm sitting in my office, and the phone rings, right? And I didn't want to be interrupted, so I sort of pick up the phone. Who is it? Right? And the voice comes back, Andy. Andy who? Right? Andy Grove. You know, at this point, I'm panicked. And, what's and uh, Andy starts shelling me with questions. What are you reading? What are you studying? What's your career objectives? Uh, you know, I'm by, at this point, I'm sort of out of my, you know, uh, focus stupor and, you know, can barely form a sentence. Those are lousy answers. Be in my office in a week with better ones. 
You know, the president tells you to be in his office in a week. What do you do? You either show up or leave the country, right? <laughs> so I show up, and this begins a mentoring relationship with Andy Grove. Now, if you're going to have a mentor in Silicon Valley, what do you think? Not a bad choice, right? There's a lot worse mentors that you can have than one of the most seminal figures in all of Silicon Valley. But mentoring with Andy Grove was like going to the dentist and not getting Novocaine. He was tough. He was difficult. If you were 90% right, you were wrong, right? You know, just pounded and for. But he made me better. So I'd say, who are the people who are making you better? Who are those influences in your life that are every day, Cal, making you better, right? Challenging you, encouraging you. And as this passage in Ecclesiastes said, a cord of three threads is not easily broken. And as I've thought about that, I think about it sort of like Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. Paul, somebody who's breathing in your life. You know, a Barnabas, a buddy on the way, and then a Timothy, somebody that you're breathing into their life. A Paul, a Barnabas, and Timothy, some help along the way as you take your journey. So maybe three ideas to help you in your juggling act. As you're struggling to make all of these things fit, be clear on where you're going. Set clear priorities and live by them. And finally, some help along the way. And that's the topic of the book. And we have some out there that you can, you know, happily get, right, uh, to, uh, you know, maybe study in your own journey of juggling. Now, as Linda and I were, you know, as I said, we lived in the Bay Area for 10 years, moved to Oregon for 20 years, and then we're in Boston for three years, and I was president of uh, EMC, and then the idea of coming to be the CEO of VMware. And when we talked about this uh, with Linda and I, she was not too excited about it, because she had said when we left the Bay Area with uh, Intel, I'm never coming back. Just a little tidbit, right? This is just a bonus, right? Never say never to God. Just, right? So, uh, and uh, the idea of coming back and being CEO of VMware, you know, a big promotion, a very visible role, but Linda sort of clawed her way all the way across the nation from Boston. She was just not excited about coming back to the Bay Area, but God had it all under control. One, two, and then three, and now six grandbabies in the Bay Area. I couldn't move her from here if I tried. Right? You know, and as I would say, you know, I used to be the most important thing in her life. You know, now I'm number seven, and I may not even be in the top ten soon enough. Right? But so, you know, so God has clearly brought our family together and blessed us in that way. But also the idea of coming to the Bay Area and being CEO of a software company, hmm, that's a pretty good job. But we were convinced that God had something bigger. And I'd ask each one of you to think about your position in the workplace, in the marketplace, and say, what bigger thing does God have in mind for you each day? God, may I be used in powerful and mighty ways. And as we came back to the Bay Area, we had sort of, you know, been involved in some of these city gospel movements, uh, first with the Palau Association in Oregon and, you know, the New York uh, Festival and some of the work that they were doing there. But this idea of can we bring together and participate and use this position of influence as a CEO to bring about change in the Bay Area. And out of that came TBC, uh, transforming the Bay with Christ, a higher purpose. And something that we thought, hmm, maybe in the Bay Area, we could bring about spiritual revival, as might not have happened for decades or ever before. And TBC, we've now, we formed the organization and coming back here and we said, these are the three missions that we have here. And sort of four little factoids about the Bay Area. One, the richest area now on planet Earth. Do you realize you are in the richest area on the planet? Arguably the most influential area on the planet with technology and the companies that are started here. You know, it's also one of the least ministered to areas on the planet as well. And isn't that scary? You know, so the fewest number of churches, fewest percentage of people going to churches. And stunningly, despite being the richest area on earth, it's one of the least philanthropic areas in the United States. Wow, think about that. Rich, influential, miserly pagans. That's our mission field. Aren't you excited? I am. 
Because when we as Christians are in the radical minority, that's when God shows up in powerful ways. And TBC, we say, here are the three things that we want to be known for in the Bay Area, that we can unify the Christian leadership. You know, John 16 and Jesus' prayer that you would be one. And as we've started to bring the Christian community together, pastors getting to know each other, coming together in unity. Secondly, that we would amplify works of service to the Bay. By your good deeds, they will glorify your Father in heaven. And finally, that will bring about church multiplication. More churches, bigger churches, more campuses. But truly, there'll be places of worship that together will come. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, in our day, there could be revival in the Bay Area. There's a piece of research that was done by a Fuller PhD student that said, in the major metropolitan areas of the United States, the Bay Area is the only one that's never had a major revival. I believe that in our day, we can see revival in the Bay Area that will become known not just for the great technology innovations, but we become known for how the Word of God and how the truth of God is represented and the innovations and in churches and how technology gets used to enable the church to reach all of humankind. That's what I want to be a part of. What do you, you in? Amen. I, yes. So the last topic I want to touch on a bit, well, what does it mean to be a Christian in the workplace? Soon after I became a Christian in February of 1980, a couple of months later, right, you know, I felt this call from God to go into ministry. Right? And, you know, I started to wrestle with God, and I said, God, please, I don't want to be like Cal Woods. No. <laughs> and I was doing so, so well and you know, technology and what I was doing and the business world. And it's like, you know, I'm just loving this microprocessor and Intel, and that's going so good. And I said, no, God, not that. So I wrestled with God for a couple, three months. And after that, I finally, like Gideon did, okay, I put a fleece before God, and I said, God, if this happens, I will become a full-time minister. And that was a huge thing for me, just, okay, you know, after wrestling with God. And as soon as I laid that fleece before God, the answer came back, the workplace is your ministry. And Colossians 3, 23 and 24, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing they receive the reward of the inheritance. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve became my life verse at that point. Now, how many of you are Christians? Okay. How many of you are full-time ministers? Okay. Let's try this again. How many of you are Christians? Okay. How many of you are full-time ministers? We're going to do this until you get it right. <laughs> right. If you have been called to Christian faith, you are a full-time minister. You are a full-time minister in the workplace, in the church place, in the home place, in the marketplace. You have been called to be a full-time minister. And a few, thank God, are vocational ministers. But all of us are called to full-time ministry. So one last time, how many of you are full-time Christians? How many of you are full-time ministers? Amen. We are all called to be full-time ministers. You know, I, I love this, uh, this passage in, uh, you know, where Paul, you know, in Athens, and Linda and I, we had the chance to go to the spot in Athens and stand where Paul gave this sermon, right? And what is he doing? He's preaching to the marketplace, Right? You know, he's there every day in the marketplace. On the average Sunday, 3 to 4% of the Bay Area goes to church. On the average Monday, 70% of the Bay Area goes to work. Do we expect the 100% to come to the 3? Or are we going to go to the 70? Right? Our job every day is to be this workplace minister, to be going daily into the workplace. Now, how do you do that, though? How do you show your faith as you're walking in the, wor in the marketplace each day? And as I like to think about this, you know, the, the, the pathway to workplace ministry 
is something that many are uncomfortable with. You know, how do I demonstrate my faith each day? I sort of get it, Pat. Okay, you made a compelling case that we're all called to be full-time ministers, but how do we show our faith each day in the workplace? And just a few thoughts in that regard. One is, you know, there's all sorts of diversity initiatives now, and people think about diversity and inclusion, right? And the idea of diversity and inclusion is enabling you to bring your whole self to the workplace, okay? Including your ethnic, sexual, right, uh, you know, historical background, but it also means your faith background as well and bringing that full integrated person into the workplace. And talking about the great sermon that you heard on Sunday, the same way you talk about the score in the Warriors game, right? Bringing and being an integrated person in the workplace. You know, secondly, values is maybe the safest place to start as you think about your workplace ministry. Because most companies, they have values like integrity, right? Have you ever seen that in any Right? You know, maybe some of your business leaders and you start talking about the values. When I talk about the VMware values, I'm giving a sermon and just not including scriptural references because almost all aspects of customers building good businesses, high integrity are based in biblical principles as well. I'll say your values is just a very safe place to start as you demonstrate the values, community involvement, right? You know, and how you're serving in the community, a safe place to start being a workplace minister. I think this is your most powerful ministry tool. Simply asking, may I pray for you? Right, somebody's in your office. They have, you know, a sick child. May I pray for you? Right, you know, they are struggling with a parent. What's her name? May I pray for them? Right, and then a week or two later, coming back and saying, how, are, how, how is your child? You know, how is your parent doing? demonstrating intimacy and true love and affection for who they are in their family situation. You know, I've said this, I find this just amazing, but I've said, may I pray for you to thousands of people and people, people I know who are atheists and agnostics. No one has ever said, no, can you believe that? Right? And you're not saying, may we pray, may I pray for you. The softest and most gentle way to just say, may I bring your concerns before my Lord and Savior. May I intervene on your behalf. I'll just say, one of your most powerful missionary tools in the workplace. May I pray for you. And finally, being a faith-friendly person and workplace. Some of you may be, you know, leading businesses. Some of you, right, in positions of influence. And one of the things I've just been amazed, right, and I'll say this is somewhat counterintuitive, you know, when I started this journey, but the more inquisitive I am of other faiths, the more I get to speak about my faith, right? This is, an, you know, one of the most diverse areas on the planet in the Bay Area, Right. You know, what's that Diwali celebration about anyway? And tell me more about what it means to, you know, the Ramadan celebration. You know, and the more that you inquire of other people's faith, the more you get to speak about your faith. So learning to be faith-friendly. And then this pluralistic environment that we're in today in the Bay Area, you know, just being ready to be this supple, right, inquisitive, soft, engaging person who's ready to show their faith every day. If there's one person in the Bible, and I have a whole sermon I like to give on this topic as well, right? Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter 6 and study the life of Daniel as a workplace minister. He rose to the second in command under three different pagan kings, right? And when the laws were set against him, what did he do? He opened his window and prayed three times a day toward Jerusalem. Right, being a workplace minister. And as I said, one of my mentors and prayer partners, Gregory, he prays for me almost every week. He says, God, may you make ma Pat a man like Daniel. And if you have one person to study in Scripture, Daniel's the man who is a workplace minister as no others. So maybe some thoughts on how you can truly be a powerful, full-time minister each day as you go to church. So in summary, you know, the juggling act, 
this idea that how do you make it all fit, right? When you got too much work, too much family, too much, you know, where does it all work? Writing your mission statement, getting clear to prioritize against your goals and being everything that God enabled you to be, right? Being, right, living by his priorities, God, family, work, and putting him on the throne each day and living according to your priorities with your family. And finally, some help along the way. And maybe in our day, we could truly see the revival of the Bay Area as never before. And tomorrow, as you begin Made for Monday, what are you going to do? Walk into the workplace, right, as never before, being ready to show the love of Jesus Christ in the workplace. And tomorrow morning, let's do a little quiz, right? You're going to walk into the workplace tomorrow morning, ready to, sh- ready to show up as this integrated person for God, you know, looking for those opportunities, and by 8.02, you're probably going to sc- screw up. <laughs> and then Tuesday, maybe 8.03, but after you work, and just one by one, work on the skills and tools that you could become a full-time minister for God in the workplace and joining me on this path to bring God's love to the Bay Area and that we might see a revival in our day. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word, right, to look at what it means to be a workplace minister, to be full-time for you, Lord Jesus Christ, that we'd be honoring you in each and every day as we uh, walk into our places of work, into the school place, into the marketplaces uh, that we're in, that in every way possible, Lord, that we would be honoring of your name, that you would be glorified, that you would be praised, and that ultimately, Lord, that you would come again, right, and we could welcome, and that you would say to us, well done, my good and faithful service. Amen.